Many think that the failure of the Russian army in the Ukrainian war is something new. But as the conflict in Crimea and more specifically the Donbass has shown us, this isn't the case. As in these conflicts, Russian troops suffered unjustifiable casualties against the poorly organized and equipped Ukrainian armed forces. This video will be part one of a two part, maybe three part series. Now focusing more on the conflict around Crimea, the violation of multiple treaties regarding the borders during the annexation of Crimea and the Black Sea Fleet. With a second video focusing on the Donbass conflict and Euromaidan. And a potential third video coming out later, which will focus on the events past 2015, which is rather unlikely because most of these events have been already covered in these videos and there's a whole playlist about the Ukrainian war. If you haven't, check it out. Well, historically, since ancient times, many people lived in the region now known as Crimea. The first group who made a lasting impact were the Turkic and Mongolic tribes who came during and following the conquest of the Mongolian Empire. While the Mongolian Empire quickly collapsed, their successor states, especially the, in the Caucasus Ukraine area, would continue their legacy. First, the Golden Horde and later the Tatar Khanate of Crimea would rule the area of Crimea. Crimea soon became a point of contention between the Ottoman and Russian empires, as it was both a vital point in the Turkic slave trade, which in all its history enslaved up to 1 million Slavs, and whoever ruled Crimea would ensure that they also controlled the whole Black Sea, thanks to its central location in the Black Sea. Crimea would end up under Russian control under the rule of Catherine the Great in 1783. While the region now was under Russian control, there still existed a large Turkic population in the peninsula, with Crimean Tatars being the biggest ethnic group till the end of the 19th century. During the Russian Civil War, Crimea was pseudo-independent and was the last bastion of white resistance against the Bolsheviks, with the defeat ending the idea of an independent Crimea and white Russian resistance. Under the Soviet Union, Crimea would be an independent SSR at first, but following World War II, it was downgraded and integrated into the larger Russian SSR as an oblast. Similar to the Ukrainians, the Tatars would suffer immensely under the collectivization efforts of the Soviet Union and the following Holodomor, with tens of thousands dying in these events. But this was only a prelude to the real horrors, which came in the tail end of World War II, as in 1944, 200,000 Crimean Tatars, almost the entire population, would be deported to Central Asia for allegedly collaborating with the Nazis. During the collapse of the Soviet Union and the years prior, many Tatars were able to resettle in Crimea as restrictions on their movement were lightened, with the Tatar population in Crimea now being around 300,000. In 1954, the Crimean Oblast was transferred from the Russian SSR to the Ukrainian SSR as an oblast. The Wilson Center claims that official reasons given for the secession of Crimea in the meeting of the Presidium Supreme Soviet of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics on the 19th of February 1954 was that this was a noble act on the part of the Russian people to commemorate the 300th anniversary reunification of Ukraine with Russia, a reference to the Treaty of Pere Yaslav signed in 1654 by representatives of the Ukrainian Cossack Hetamate and Tsar Alexei I of Moscovy to evince the boundless trust and love the Russian people feel toward the Ukrainian people, and that the transfer was an outgrowth of the territorial proximity of Crimea to Ukraine, commonalities of their economies, and the close agricultural and cultural ties between Crimean oblast and the Ukrainian SSR. But following the Wilson Center, neither of these claims make any sense, as even though 1944 was the 300th anniversary of the Treaty of Perislava, there is no connection between that treaty and the Crimean Peninsula. Perislava in central Ukraine, not far from Kiev, is nowhere near Crimea and the treaty had nothing to do with the peninsula which did not come under Russian control until 130 years later. And further, the notion that the transfer was justified solely by Crimea's cultural and economic ties with Ukraine is also far-fetched. In the 1950s, the population of Crimea, approximately 1.1 million, was roughly 75% ethnic Russian and only 25% Ukrainian. In 1954, Crimea was more Russian than it had ever been in previous centuries, although Crimea is briefly contiguous with southern Ukraine via the Isthmus of Perekop, the large eastern Kerch region of Crimea, which is very close to Russia, the peninsula did have important economic and infrastructural ties with Ukraine, but cultural ties were much stronger overall with Russia than with Ukraine. The Wilson Center hence claims that the transfer was more of a move to secure control over Russia following the brutal campaign against the Ukrainian insurgent army, which resulted in up to 150 members of the UPA getting killed with around 130 members captured and deported to gulags in the east. Through the transfer of Crimea with a large Russian
Russian population, which would only add up to the minority of Russians already living in Ukraine, the Russians and further the Soviet influence in Ukraine would be boosted while gaining support from the Ukrainian people for the transfer of Crimea to Ukraine. Collapse of the Soviet Union would be devastating for all post-Soviet states, as essentially all of the economic and political and military systems had to be reorganized and redrawn, as the Soviet Union understandably wasn't built for regional states to be fully independent and self-sufficient, in some cases state borders being specifically drawn to hamper any independent country, such as in the case of Central Asia. The post-Soviet states would be shaped by the transition from Union states to independent states, which now often had control over large portions of original Soviet military gear, which in many cases Russians who saw themselves as the rightful successor to the Soviet Union would want to have back, exemplified especially by the Soviet nuclear arsenal. Through the Soviet nuclear doctrine, a large part of the Soviet Union's nuclear arsenal was stationed in the border states, which once the Union was dissolved, left a large part of the Soviet nuclear arsenal, around 5,000 missiles in total, inside Ukraine, Belarus and Kazakhstan, both as a result of the Russian interest in retaining its nuclear weapons stationed in these countries and US slash NATO interest in the safe storage and proper upkeep of the Soviet nuclear arsenal, which the independent states in most cases couldn't provide thanks to their poor economic state. In 1944, the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurance was signed between Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus, Ukraine, United Kingdoms and United States. The Budapest Memorandums would for one assure that Russia would retain all of the nuclear weapons left in the other states. The Budapest Memorandums would also assure Ukraine, Belarus and Kazakhstan of the sovereignty of their borders and would forbid Russia from using threats, use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of the signatories of the memorandum. The border between Ukraine and Russia was further defined through the border treaty of 2003, where Russia and Ukraine agreed on the 1991 border. Besides the nuclear arsenal of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Black Sea fleet also became a large conflict point, as most of the Black Sea fleet was still stationed in Sevastopol, which now was officially part of Ukraine. Subsequently, a large part of the status of the fleet, of which many were Russians, now swore their allegiance to government in Kiev, which resulted in their families being harassed for being so-called traitors. Under Russian pressure, a temporary agreement was reached, which would see the Black Sea fleet under de jure joint Russian-Ukrainian control, operating under bilateral command and using the old Soviet naval flag until an actual partition plan could be drawn up. But even during this joint fleet, the Russian government was able to exert control over the fleet, if not officially, then indirectly, as a large part of the fleet was made up of Russians and new admiral of the fleet became a Russian. Besides the loss of the most important navy base in the Black Sea, Russia also lost the large dry docks at Kerch and the Mikolaev Odessa Kherson shipyards, which were vital for the Soviet nation. As an example, the only shipyard which could construct Soviet aircraft carriers were the shipyards at Mikolaevka. Funny enough, the only current operating Russian aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, was nearing its completion during the dissolution, but was stolen after Ukrainian independence and after it was declared to be part of the Ukrainian Navy. The original partition plan would see the former BSF be divided 50-50 between the two countries, but the partition treaty of 1997 would see Russia taking control of about 82% and Ukraine only 18% of the fleet. Besides the partition of the fleet, both sides agreed on the following, on a Russian naval base in Sevastopol, which would be able to station up to 25,000 soldiers till the year 2017, Russia would have to pay an annual fee of $97 million for the military presence and a straight up payment of around 5 million US dollars for their part of the fleet. Russia would also have to respect the sovereignty of Ukrainians borders regarding especially Crimea. This treaty would allow Russia to maintain a dominant position in the Black Sea, but it would also stop Ukraine from pursuing any idea of NATO membership as NATO countries were not allowed to house non-NATO military bases in their territory. While Russia now had a suitable Black Sea Navy base in Sevastopol, the Russian government was still unsure about the future of this base, as the Ukrainian constitution forbid the nation from having any foreign military bases inside the country from 2017 onwards. This led the Russian government to begin construction of a new navy base in Novoruskiy in Krasnodar Krai on the Russian Black Sea coast. In 2003, the base gained an importance as Putin signed a decree allocating almost 500 million US dollars to the further expansion of this base up until the year 2013. Seven years before the lease on the port of Sevastopol would end, the Ukrainian and Russian governments signed another treaty, the Kharkiv Pact. Signed in Kharkiv, the treaty would extend the lease on the port for another 25 years till the year 2042, with another five-year expansion possible. And in return, Russia would lower the price of gas exported to Ukraine by 30%. This treaty did end up being 
unpopular amongst both Russia and Ukraine, as Ukraine claimed this agreement was unconstitutional, with NOMOS Bank Center for Black Sea Security Studies Director Sergei Kulki even saying, For Ukraine, the Black Sea Fleet is like a cancer that will grow larger and more dangerous until 2042. ICE and Security Watch, September 15, 2010. Russia openly benefited from this treaty, but still was bound to the limit on the ships that they could station in Sevastopol, being around 25 ships, making it the second smallest Russian fleet right after the Caspian Sea fleet. While following the annexation, many in the Russian government claimed that the Black Sea fleet, now with full control over Sevastopol and the Kerch dry dock, would be expanded by as much as 30 warships, with Russian Navy Commander-in-Chief Admiral Viktor Cherkov stating that the Black Sea fleet will receive 30 new warships, over the next six years, this didn't manifest as currently, almost nine years later, the force has only expanded by 16 total ships, most of them being minor combatants, while losing its most important ship, the Moskva, during the Ukraine war. As in 2015, one year after the annexation, the Russian Black Sea Fleet had four submarines, one guided missile cruiser, one guided missile destroyer, zero guided missile frigates, two frigates, six light frigates, nine patrol gunboats and seven landing ships this being eight major combatants and 22 minor combatants in the year 2015 ending up being around 30 ships in 2023 they had seven submarines zero guided missile cruisers zero guided missile destroyers three guided missile frigates two frigates 17 light frigates 11 patrol gunboats and six landing ships. So in 2023, they had 12 major combatants and 34 minor combatants, ending up with a total 46 ships. Following the Euromaidan, Russia would violate multiple treaties they had signed earlier. The Border Treaty of 2003, the 1997 Partition Treaty, and the Budapest Memorandum. As in early 2014, pro-Russian protests in Crimea would escalate their actions, leading to a series of events. Armed individuals without clear identification marks surrounded airports in Smirnopol and Sevastopol, and mass gunmen occupied the Crimean Parliament building, hoisting a Russian flag. Pro-Russian lawmakers ousted the sitting government and appointed Sergei Akisnovo, Crimean Prime Minister. Communication links between Crimea and Ukraine were cut and Russia admitted to deploying troops in the region. Ukraine officials criticized these actions as a provocation and a violation of their sovereignty, which had been agreed on previous, where Russian President Vladimir Putin claimed it was to protect Russian citizens and military assets. Akisnovo asserted his control over Crimean police and military forces in Crimea. On March 6, the Crimean parliament voted to succeed from Ukraine and joined in Russia with controversial referendum scheduled for March 16 on 2014. Russians supported this move, but the West strongly condemned it. The referendum was marred by irregularities, including armed presence at polling stations, and it resulted in overwhelming 97% voting in favor of joining Russia. The interim government in Kiev rejected the outcome, leading the United States and the EU to impose sanctions on Russian officials and Crimean parliament members. On the 18th of March, Putin signed a treaty incorporating Crimea into the Russian Federation, sparking further protests from Western governments. Soon after the treaty signed, violence erupted as mass gunmen attacked a Ukrainian military outpost in Smyrnovobol, resulting in cat Russian troops took control over several military bases across Crimea, including the Ukrainian naval headquarters at Sevastopol. Ukraine initiated the evacuation of thousands of military personnel and their families from Crimea. Finally, on March 21st, the Russian parliament ratified the annexation treaty. Putin signed a law firmly integrating Crimea into Russia. During the annexation of Crimea, a large part of the Ukrainian naval high command deserted to Russia, partially being the reason for why Russia was able to gain control over a large part of the Ukrainian navy, with this leading to the capture of a large part of the 25 warships and more than 50 service ships that Ukraine had prior to this war. This included four Grisha 5-class corvettes, one POW-class patrol vessel, four landing ships, two minesweepers, and the only Ukrainian submarine, the Vortex-class Zaporizhia, and the former Ukrainian flagship, being one of the Bamboo class. It was noted multiple times by Russian officials that their ships were in horrible condition thanks to Ukrainian inability
ability to pay for the upkeep of these ships. Well, Russia agreed to sending back the ships to Ukraine. Only four of the combatant ships, a Grisha class corvette, a Paul Coney small landing ship, Evgeny minesweeper and a Martak X missile boat and 31 various auxiliary vessels were returned to Ukraine. With most of the other ships being completely scrapped due to their poor state, with only the Vortex class submarine Zaporizhia being refurbished for $20 million being put back into Russian service. The annexation would lit the first fuse, which would begin the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Thank you for listening um, to this incredibly epic video. Um, I think this will be the biggest one since a long while, and I hope would be the best one in a long while. Um, the next part will, won't be the next video because I want to take a short break from Ukraine war-related content because um, I think like the last four videos were either related to it or um, were related to Russia and somewhat the Ukrainian war, which I don't really want to do anymore. I want to take a short break. Um, I'm thinking maybe something regarding Africa, maybe West Africa and like France. Um, I have a lot of other ideas, um, but those will be more like um, back older history um, topics. Uh, I will have to think about it, but there will be more videos. A better schedule. I'm trying to get one out every uh, Wednesday. Um, I probably won't be able to do that because I'm lazy as fuck. But you know, you have to keep on that grind, man. Marcus Weissmann, out.